is Michael Grundy and happy Juneteenth to all of you. You too, thank you. And welcome. And uh, this guy up front, this is my grandson. His name is Thomas. So uh, always glad to have him tag along with me. So uh, today is uh, Juneteenth and we're gonna talk a little bit about unsung heroes. People that don't get a lot of credit, uh, but still do fabulous, great things. But being Juneteenth, first of all, I think we should probably talk a little bit about Juneteenth, and then that maybe will lead us into some unsung heroes, okay? So most of you know that, well, if you're from Texas or if you're not from Texas by now, you know that Juneteenth is a celebration of when uh, General Granger finally got to Galveston and read uh, Order 3 saying that there would be no more slavery in Texas and slaves were free. Here come some folks coming in. Come on in, we'll wait until you get here before we go in any further. We knew that you were coming and we didn't want to say it too much. So if you go back to June, to uh, June 19th, 1865, that's when Granger arrived. Now, there's a whole lot of misconceptions about Juneteenth, I think. And uh, so you just have to take this as uh, Michael's view of things for this, okay? Uh, the first thing is, uh, I, I love Miss, uh, Miss Opal and what she's done for uh, Juneteenth. And I really like the fact that she's done all that walking at her age, because that inspires me to keep doing my running at my age. And, and I think it's a big deal when somebody uh, makes that kind of personal commitment to do something for others and has an, uh, a vision and a goal of something that's even bigger than themselves, and to actually make it come true. And to be able to actually get Juneteenth to be a national holiday, I, I think that's a big deal for her. Now, my problem with it gets to be when, when we get some of those words kind of mixed up, when we think that Juneteenth is the day that all the slaves were free, or we think that Juneteenth was the, 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 the big deal that, that ended slavery. And my problem with that is because uh, if we're gonna be good citizens and good Americans and go by the law, which is the Constitution, then we know that one, the Constitution was an imperfect document, hence we have amendments to it, and we correct it. And the first time around, the Constitution said, well, black people, y'all are really not included in this. So we had amendments, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, that changed those things. And I think when we leave that part of the story out, then, then I think even for young people and, and people around now, they don't realize that there's ways that we change that document. And the way that we change that is through amendments. Because with amendments, it means that three-fourths of all of the states, which really means most all of us have agreed that this is how we're gonna go about things, okay? And this is what the new law is gonna be. Well, if it's just a proclamation, emancipation proclamation, well, that doesn't get you to the same thing. It's the same as today when we talk about a president who has an executive order, but then it's not followed up by making it a law or actually putting it in the Constitution. It doesn't have the same roots and it doesn't hang around as long. It can be, it can be changed. Hence, we need to have that. 13th Amendment, which didn't come until December 1865, which is six months after Juneteenth, okay? The, the other thing about Juneteenth, they always say, well, you know, the slaves didn't get the word about they were free until June, you know? And, and, and that's because, you know, all kinds of reasons, because they were so far away or because they wanted to get in the next harvest beforehand or, or whatever it might be. But when we do that, there again, we, it's kind of like misinformation. It's like, you know, we, we all know we had telegraphs then, right? There were telegraph wires during the Civil War. There were telegraphs during that time, okay? So it wasn't a matter of, oh, somebody had to walk the message from D.C. all the way to Texas, because if that was the case, they could have even did that in less than two and a half years. And if they can get the word to Louisiana and they can get the word to New Mexico, then I don't know how they skip Texas in the middle. The, the reality is that there's 125 different newspaper articles from September till emancipation that were written in Texas newspapers that said, hey, this, this, is, what the new, this is what's going on. Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. There, there's no more slavery. 
So it wasn't like, you know, they didn't know. But imagine in your own mind that you were on the plantation or you were doing slave work and you heard the, the Emancipation Proclamation and there was no more slavery. Now, I bet you ain't dumb enough to get up and think you're gonna walk off the plantation just because you heard something. Because if Massa ain't heard it, it don't really count. And if Massa done heard it and he ain't abiding by it, it still doesn't count. Right. So the idea that we didn't know in Texas, they knew in Texas, okay? They knew very well in Texas. People moved their slaves to Texas because it was far enough away and that they would be safe in, in Texas. So it wasn't like we didn't get the word for two and a half years in, in Texas. It, it just took a little while before some people could be convinced that this is the new law, this is the way things are gonna be. And that took an army of people coming to Texas. Now when they say that they marched into Galveston, people in Texas know that you can't march into Galveston, right? You, you gotta take a boat, you gotta take a boat. Somehow you gotta take a boat. And, and what happened was Colonel Granger did that, okay? And he pretty much, got, got to Galveston on June 19th, got to Houston the next day. And, and you don't cover the whole state of Texas just by standing somewhere on a balcony and reading a, 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 a flyer. It, it, it takes time to, to go from one city to the next city to get and to enforce that. So you can imagine that it wasn't just, oh, on that day, now all y'all free. And it wasn't about whether you knew you were free or not. It meant that somebody, mainly, the people in charge had to submit to that and say, yes, we're going to abide by that law. But when we talk about Juneteenth, we seldom talk about what happened after emancipation. What happened after the Civil War? What, what happened after to, those, to those black people? What happened after that? Because so many of us think that, oh, it would have been so different if I had been a slave. If I had been there, you know, I'd have got up and walked right out of there. I, they couldn't have held me down. No, I wouldn't have took that stuff. No, not me. But, but, but then we kind of forget that on, on top of 1865, you have 10 generations, 10 generations at least of slaves, 10 generations of enslaved people. And if all you have ever known is that your great, great, great grandparents and everyone else has always been enslaved, I don't think that's going to be quite your mindset. Right. You know, I, I've got people put that. <laughs> they were Route Two, Mississippi, way back, back in the woods. And when you go back there, then you get a real sense of what it must have been like to be isolated from the rest of the country. You're just with those particular people on your particular plantation, or in your county at best. Maybe once a month you might go into town and you might see some people and might hear some people, but the black people wouldn't necessarily get that. So you, you wouldn't even know. And we think, oh, well, you know, I would have just got my GPS. No GPS, you wouldn't have used GPS to get anywhere. There would be no street lights, no stop signs, no maps. And when you get way out there in the country, if some of you have been out in the country, you look around, it's like, which way do I go? And, and I understand that they had the North Star, but I looked at that North Star, and I don't know if I could keep track. You know, you're just looking at a star, and you're going to let that guide you? That's not quite as accurate as even the phones that we have nowadays. So that whole idea about what I would have done, you know, it's like, you know, it's hard to put yourself into those people's shoes. So imagine that now you have been free, okay? The first thing, if you read General Granger's order, one of the last couple of sentences at the end of the order, what it says is that now there will be a new relationship between the master and the slave, and it now will be an employer and an employee relationship. And they were encouraged, they were told, don't leave your plantation, okay? You just have a different situation and a different relationship, but you're still gonna stay here. And the, the white plantation owners, their, their way of combating that was to say, let's not hire anybody else's slaves or ex-slaves, and that way they have nowhere else to go. So now you have a couple of choices when there's no longer gonna be slavery and you're gonna be free. You can stay there on, on that property where, where you know people, where you're comfortable, where you're gonna probably get fed and have a roof over your head. And you'll probably be in sharecropping or some kind of similar situation with the, the owners of the land. Now, now you can do that. And some people say that that wasn't much better than just being a slave anyway. 
Now, the other thing, you could just say, hey, I'm leaving. I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to find a job. But if, this, if things have been stacked up against you, where are you, where are you going to find a job? And, and the biggest thing that the law used then was vagrancy. If you were vagrant and you were black, you could be arrested. Now, you're part of convict labor. So either way, you're going to be working one way or the other. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. And those guys, they had a few choices. And one choice that a lot of them made was to go west. To go west and get as far away from their plantations and master as they could possibly go. And to take the skills that they had with them. So if you had been an ex-slave, you probably had some skills of working in the kitchen so you could cook. Maybe you did some farming, so you, you know something about planting and, 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 and gardening. M maybe you attended to the flock and you know about horses and cows and sheep. And, and if you worked in the house, they called you the house boy. And if you worked out in the field, they called you the field boy. And if you worked with the cows, they called you the cow boy. And after the Civil War, all of a sudden, we had a lot of cattle that needed to be moved. And we didn't have railroads yet, and there was no easy way to get those cattle to move north or east. And that's where you end up coming up with cowboys. Hmm. Now, if you were a white guy and you were handling those cows, you were a cow hand. But if you were a black, you know, because boy is supposed to be a negative thing, you were a cow boy. That's where we get those terms. If you look at even what the jobs and what the things that cowboys did, those were the same jobs that slaves had had before. It, it was the, the, the cowboy, the black cowboy, who had to break the wild, misbehaved horse. He was the one that had to risk his life and get up on that horse and break that horse. Later on, that became a big deal with, with cowboys. It was he who had to go run down the cattle and brand the cattle with master's brand. All of those things. The, the roping, all of that, the riding, all of that was skills that they had learned. And now they brought them out to the plains. They brought them to Texas. They brought them west. And those became the cowboys. And as you drive cattle up north to go to Kansas, to Dodge City, to Kansas City, to Chicago, to Omaha, so that they could there hit the railroads and then go all over, that's how all of those cattle went. And those men had to do that work. They say, statistics say that anywhere from a fourth to a third of all the cowboys were black. And it kind of makes sense when you stop and think about it. You know, who was going to be doing that kind of work? Now, on a typical cow drive, that trail team would consist of maybe a dozen people, 12 guys, okay? Now, <laughs> similar to like what you see around Texas when you get any kind of household work done, the head guy in charge is the white guy, okay? So you can bet that the trail boss was the white guy, okay? Now there might have been another three or four other white guys who were working, the guy, number two guy, whatever. And then there'd be about three, maybe three black guys who were working. And one of them would probably be the cook. And there might be one who was black who also played the banjo so they'd have some entertainment too. Sounds kind of familiar. Then you add a couple of Mexican guys and you got a group of 12. And that would be the typical trail team. Now that's not what we see when we look at TV or when we see the movies. I mean, it, it's nothing like that at all. Matter of fact, I can't remember seeing a black trail cook in any movie, on any TV show, anywhere. I, I'm not surprised not to see a black trail boss, but, but I mean, the, the cook, you guys know who the cook is gonna be. Just like who's gonna be the guy who brought the harmonica and the banjo and singing. It's gonna be that guy, right? But that was what that team would have looked like. Those would have been what we call cowboys. Now to me, those cowboys, black, white, Mexican, whatever, those are part of the unsung heroes of the country. People that we don't usually think of as heroes, we don't talk about them as being heroes. But if you think about it, that's going to be the e economics of the country. That's going to be the food for the country. That's going to be how the country survives off of the exploits and the works of these men who are willing to drive those cattle. Okay. Because not just cattle is really going along with that whole cattle drive. I mean, we're including horses, sheep, all kind of things, but we talk mainly about the cattle because that's the beef. But that was the industry. That was it. And it was cowboys. 
black cowboys who were doing it. Now, there's a lot of different black cowboys. I'm gonna tell you a couple just so that you know some names because uh, I, I want you at least to be able to say, yeah, I heard about that guy before, okay? Now, one of the, one of the easy ones, okay? By now, I would think most everybody here has heard of Bass Reeves, right? You've heard of Bass Reeves, right? Now, you haven't heard of Bass Reeves? Oh, okay, Bass Reeves was, he wasn't the cowboy doing the cowboy stuff. He was like a martial kind of cowboy, okay? He was out there getting the bad guys. Bass Reeves was credited with, with getting 3,000 people arrested. So if you can imagine the old days when Oklahoma was a territory and Kansas was a territory and Arkansas was a territory, well, that's the places where the bad guys went. That's where people went where they didn't want to be caught and because no, there was no law, there was no, no government, no cities, nobody would have you there. So Bass Reeves, he had been a slave. And as a slave, when the war came, he had to go with his master to, to go and, and be there to support him doing the, on the Confederate side. Well, they were playing cards one night and he, Bass and the guy, his boss, Reeves, they got into an argument. And Bass hit the guy and they got in a big fight and, and he ran, left, ran to Oklahoma. And he went to Oklahoma and he lived with all kinds of different Indian tribes, the Native Americans, the Creeks, the Crows, the Cherokees, learned their languages, learned their way of being. And then when the Civil War was over with, he came back and, and left the Indians. But then he needed a job. Well, there was this guy, they called him the Hanging Judge, Judge Parker, who was over all of Oklahoma, all the territory. And his job was to hire marshals. He hired 200 U.S. marshals to go out and get the convicts. So he would give them the wanted papers and say, okay, now you go get this guy and there's a, bring him back dead or alive. And there's a, and a war, reward or whatever, okay? And he had 200 guys doing this job. And they called him the hanging judge because he wasn't very tall. Anybody came back and they probably got hung. Well, Bass needed the job. But one thing the U.S. Marshals had to do was they had to be able to read and write. And Bass couldn't read or write. But the brother had a heck of a memory. And he would just look at it. Be having to read the the one of that the one of papers to him about who the guy was or height and all that and then he would go out and get him. Now the guy said, "Wait a minute!" To, for the first time for his job to get hired, the judge gave him a list of five people. He said, "Okay, go get these five bad guys, and I'll give you three months to get them back dead or alive." In less than three weeks, Bass had brought them all back. He ended up capturing three thousand people and only having to kill 14 of them in self-defense. That, that, that's not a bad deal. No. He, he was, had such integrity that one time his son was in trouble. His son was, they had a warrant out for his son's arrest. His son had, had killed his wife and ran off. And the hanging judge was going to send the marshal out. And Bass said, hey, send me. I'll go get and said, but that, that's your son. You're gonna go get your own son. And he, and he went and got him. And, and he brought him back to justice. And his son served 13 years in Leavenworth, my hometown. Leavenworth, okay, in prison. And came out and lived the rest of his life as a model citizen. But can you imagine somebody who would do that? Well, one other thing that Bass did was when he'd go out and track those bad guys, those criminals, well, he would use all the information that he had learned from living with the Native Americans. And every now and then he would hire one of those guys to go with him to help do the tracking. And, that, and they were like a team. Years later, they began to tell the story of Bass Reeves. Okay? And they would tell the story on the radio. And when they would tell them about Bass Reeves, they would leave out the part that Bass Reeves was a black guy. And when they found out, oh, well, we had to change the story a little bit. And they put a black mask over the guy, and they called him the Lone Ranger. Wow. So when you're watching the Lone Ranger, you're hearing the story of Bass Reeves, a guy who brought 3,000 convicts to justice. Isn't that wild? <laughs> that, that, I mean, those were black cowboys, ain't it? Now, the, one of my favorite ones, you know how rodeos are going? Okay, you like rodeos? You know, most of those things that you see in rodeos, well, that was the cowboy's way of entertaining themselves as well as brushing up on their skills. 
That's why you have the roping of the horses and the, and the blancos and breaking the horses and all that kind of stuff. Well, there's this guy named Bill Pickett. Now, Bill Pickett was a heck of a rodeo guy. He would give you a show, no matter where you would go, okay? He's the one that invented the idea of bulldog. That's when they ride on the horse and they jump off the horse and they grab him by the by their horns and they're twisting down and turning down. You gotta do it in eight seconds or whatever. That that thing. That was his invention, okay? But here's what he would do to even top that, okay? He used to watch the dogs that they would have that would, you know, train the, and, and help herd the horses and the cows. And what he found out when the dogs would herd the cows, there was a special way that they controlled the cows. They would do it by biting the cow's lower lip. And the cow would follow the dog wherever. I mean, weird, okay? Bill Pickett get on the horse with his hands tied behind his back, ride alongside the cow, jump off the horse, grab the cow's lip with his teeth and take the cow down. Can you imagine that? I'd have to really see it down to, to, to believe it, but that's the story. That's the story of how he did this bulldog, that he could control a cow by biting his lip. But, but, but cowboys, black cowboys, hey, there's tons of them, okay? Nate Love is another good one. Nate Love is one that they, they call him Deadwood Dick because he told such wild stories. And he had stories about how he hung out with Billy the Kid, and how he knew all Bat Masterson, he knew all the cowboys of the day. He had been a slave who left home, went to Dodge City, found a job there, rusting and helping out with cows. But his big deal was that he wrote stories. So if you go back to the Civil War, black men fought in the Civil War. There were 180,000 black men who fought in the Civil War, okay? And the majority of them were on, on the Union side, of course. And afterwards, they didn't have a lot to do. So the first thing that the government did, the Congress did, they came up with two more infantry divisions just for black, the 9th and the 10th, in, in, uh, 9th and 10th Cavalry, and the 24th and the 25th uh, Infantry uh, Divisions, okay? So infantry means you're on your feet, cavalry means you're on the horse, okay? Now, Texas and my hometown, we kind of share those things like the Buffalo Soldiers. We all like to, you know, claim them, but they really started in my hometown. They started in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. That's the 9th and the 10th. But since they served the whole West, everybody knows about them. Now, what the Buffalo Soldiers were, were all those guys who used to be in the, in the service, who now needed a job, well, they joined the 9th and the 10th Cavalry. And any other guys who needed a job, because just like my folks used to tell me, if you get a good government job, you know, you're in shape. And even back then, that was a good government job. They got paid $13 a month. You got, you know, clothes, even though it was kind of crazy to be wearing that heavy wool in the summer. But they got clothes, a roof over their head, and they got fed. That, that was a good government job. And, and, you know, if you got a good government job or if you got a good job, period, sometimes you may have to do some stuff you don't want to do or that you don't agree with, but you got a good government job. And the Buffalo Soldiers had good government jobs, okay? Part of that job that we don't hear about is that their job was to protect all those folks who were moving west. Whether it was the settlers on the covered wagons that were going west, you, you never notice or see the fact that, yeah, they were being protected. They were being protected by the army, by the cavalry, by Buffalo soldiers who would be riding along with them. The same thing is true with the people who were building the railroads as the railroads were going across the country. They were also being protected. They were being protected from Native Americans and, and, and wild Indian tribes. They were being protected from animals, all kinds of different things. That was the Buffalo soldiers. That was their, their job. As, as people would put up telegraphs going across the country, they would be the ones doing that. Now, now they're, they're greatly known for all their valor and their courage in, in the fighting, okay? And, and all the, the things that they did on, on the battlefield. The, the paradox happens to be that they were oppressed people who were also fighting oppressed people. But like I said, that's a good government job. You got to do what the government says, so it means you have to shoot Native Americans because that's what's happening right now then, you know, but, but that was their thing. Ever gone to a national park? 
like Yellowstone, Yosemite, or any of those? And you ever see uh, Smokey the Bear with that little funny hat on, you know, only you can prevent forest fires? The first park rangers were the Cross Rose soldiers. That was their job. When, when Roosevelt and all the folks said, hey, we're going to have all this land in some of these great parks, they were the ones who built the trails, built the bridges, built the campsites so that people could come and, and see. And consequently, that little hat is just as like the hats that they used to wear, the Crossroads soldiers. So not only were they fantastic for fighting and helping open the country for that, but they also helped us with all of our national parks. Those are some good, unsung heroes. Now, 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 the Buffalo Soldiers were around, well, it wasn't until 1948 before President Truman desegregated the Army. So up until then, the Buffalo Soldiers, I mean, that's, that's how they were. They were over here fighting, and uh, they, didn't, they had white officers, and they didn't always get the best officers because that wasn't a good career path for a white officer to say, hey, I was over here running the black troops. You know, that you, you're not going to probably get promoted too quick there, so it, the officers that they got probably weren't going to be the best officers, not the smartest ones, but that, that was the situation. But they were unsung heroes, I think, in so many ways, for fighting, for protecting, most of all, and, and then greatly for just being good park service, the ones that nobody ever wanted to fight. Now, if you were in the military up until the time when the president said they were for you were going to be considered a Buffalo soldier just because you were black. After that, though, things began to change. So the services were still segregated in World War II, but you had some there who were some unsung heroes that we don't even hear and talk about. Now, one of them that I think most everybody should know, I know all you guys know about this one, Doris Miller, right? Yeah. Now, I always thought it was Doris Miller, but his real name was Doris Miller. You should know him because he's from Waco. He's in Texas. He, he, he joined the Navy right here in Dallas. I mean, this is where he signed up. So, so he's like, and if you ever go to Waco, they have a big memorial, a big statue of him, and they talk all about Doris Miller. When, when, when he was his mom was pregnant, and the midwife, I guess she wasn't as good as what they have nowadays, but she told his mother that he was going to be a girl. So they named him Doris before he got here. And then once he got here, he got kind of stuck with that name, and that's how they ended up doing Doris Miller. Well, the story wasn't really good in school either. You know, he kind of, he, he flunked out of high school a couple of times. And after a while, he said, heck with this thing, I'm going to just go join the military. Now, why he chose the Navy, I, I'm not sure, because in my day, you didn't want to choose the Navy if you were black, because it means you'd be out there in the, the water all by yourself, and there wouldn't be anybody else that looked like you. So I, I always wondered why a black man would ever choose the Navy, but that, that was his choice. Maybe he thought it was safer than being out on the front line getting, getting shot at. But Doris was on the ship in Pearl Harbor, and that's why everybody knows about him, because that was his in fact, in those days, if you were black, you didn't get a chance. You weren't going to be an officer. And you didn't have a whole lot of uh, good training. You didn't have much job. Your job was going to miss you. You were a mess man. That meant that you did laundry. And that meant that you served food. That meant that you cleaned the officer's clothes, that kind of stuff. But you didn't do anything with a gun. Oh, no. You surely are not going to let black men have any guns on here. And you're not going to get near the size of torpedoes or the bomb. None of that kind of stuff. So Dory had not been trained in any kind of weaponry. He didn't know anything. None of that stuff. He was just a mess guy. And one morning while he was folding and sorting clothes, that's when the bombs started coming, the torpedoes started coming, and the Japanese started bombing Pearl Harbor. Well, Dory came up from, from down below and, and saw all of this craziness going on. And the first thing that he did was he started helping and, and saving some of his comrades, okay, and pulling them off to safety. He, even the, the captain, he pulled him off so he could be sheltered away from all the, the damage and stuff. And, and then, then, he, well, there's two different stories. One guy tells the story. This is the white guy's story. He says, I told him just to go, you know, feed the ammunition into the machine gun. But he went off and got a gun by himself. That, that, that's his story. Now, Dory's story is that, no, he just went over and got the gun. So however it turned out to be, he went and got one of those big machine guns. And they credited him with shooting down at least two of the Japanese planes as they flew around bombing our tall little ship. Dory Miller, Doris Miller, from Waco, Texas, became 
famous Holocaust attempt. And now, now, not only did he get the Medal of Honor after he died, but now they're naming a U.S. carrier a ship after him. And the ship's supposed to be launched, I think they say, in 2029. Apparently it takes a long time to do the thing. But there's going to be a ship named after him. And I think that is funny. Yeah. Wow. But a mess man, mess guy, will tell you. Now, the, you have to understand, look, if, if you're the mess guy, and it's back in the can you imagine you're the black guy on the ship and your job is just that you're doing the, the dirty work. You're washing the people's clothes and cooking and all that. that that's all you're allowed to do. There's this guy named El, Alvin Ball, Ball, B A L L, Alvin Ball, okay? And Alvin, that was his job on the ship. And that's all he got to do. And he was on a ship called the USS Lexington. The Lexington ship had, had not been in Pearl Harbor since back in December. They had been out of Wake Island, so they, they missed out. And they went back and forth, but eventually they were at a midway island out in the Pacific. And their ship gets bombed and torpedoed. And eventually it's burning up, there's fire everywhere, okay? Now this guy, who gets very little respect from his comrades, has the lowest job around, when it comes down to, oh, we've got a fire and we need to abandon ship. But the three guys that are down below, and we can't quite get to him. You know, somebody's got to volunteer to go through the smoke, the fire, down the steps, all the way down to the engine room, get those guys and, and bring them back. Now, you would think, you would think that the mess guy, the little black guy, he'd be one of the last ones to raise his hand and say, I'll go, I'll go. You know, go go after some guys who haven't been talking to you every day, haven't been smiling at you every day, haven't been even acknowledging you every day on the ship. You're going to go. He said, I'll go. And he was the only one who said, I'll go. It was one of those deals where they say, somebody step forward and everybody else step back. <laughs> he got caught. And he went all the way down, past the fire, the smoke, all the way down, and got the three guys. Brought them all back. And then they abandoned the ship. He brought them back. Got the Navy Cross, the highest Navy medal for that, for doing that. A, a mess man. And, and, and it's one of the stories that we don't hear. And to me, that's some funny stuff to hear. Yeah. But let me tell you my favorite story. This, this guy is something else, okay? This guy's name is Charles Jackson. Okay. What's his last name? Jackson. Charles Jackson. I may have to put him in Jackson in a second. But he was on a ship, and he was a mess man too, okay? And his ship got Everybody on the ship was in the water. And what he did, he went out and got 15 of his guy, other guys out of the water, pulled those 15 men into the raft, okay? And the Japanese are shooting and bombing all over. And the raft is drifting toward the island where the Japanese are. He takes a rope, ties the rope around this boat, and ties it to the boat. And it's a human and he pulled a life raft of 15 white guys and pulled them for eight hours through shark infested waters before they're finally picked up by some Marines on another island. Can you imagine that? Eight hours swimming is a big deal. Tugging somebody, shark infested waters at night, that is like unbelievable. Now his story didn't didn't get broadcasted too much at first, and and after a while, all they would say some black guy did this that stuff. And then one day, one of the white officers had happened to be in the ship. He had told his daughter the story, and that's how it got to the radio, to the TVs, and to the newspapers. People started hearing that stuff. And you know, the guys that were on the tugboat that had been injured, that he had pulled out of the water and, and helped rescue. All got Purple Hearts for bravery and for being injured. And you know what Charles got? He got a letter. He got a letter from the Admiral saying, good job. That was it. But that's one of those stories for me that would make a great movie. You know? A 
mean, Tom Cruise couldn't play the hero, but it would still be a great movie. You could get some black guy to play him and be the great hero. But, but my whole point, and, and the reason for telling you those stories is because, one, to let you know that black people had to find out and do something after June the 10th. They had to find a way to survive, and they had to find a way not to be vagrants. And one way they did it was getting jobs, and those jobs turned out to be cowboys. Another thing that they did was they went into the service, and those guys turned out to be Buffalo soldiers who, who would open up the West. And, and those guys, just like the black heroes from, from the Navy, those are unsung heroes. Those are people that all of us need to know about. Everybody, you know? I think the white folks need to know about the black heroes, and the black folks need to know about the black heroes, and, and vice versa. See, because one, if, if I'm black and I know about the black heroes, hey, I'm pumped up, okay? But if you're white and you know about the black heroes, you know that you can trust me, because you know I might, be one, I might be one of those good guys. And, and the same thing goes the opposite way, you know, it's either way. So to me, if we start to recognize everybody's contribution, man, imagine what, what you can do when everybody's working together. And everybody says, hey, we all got, got some skin in this game. So that, that, that's my story about unsung heroes. And uh, I'll leave you with uh, my, well, it's an analogy that I, that I just like to, uh, to share with folks occasionally. And uh, it, it, it's because we, we are in a country and we're in a state, we're in a city that sometimes has a lot of division. And we got a whole bunch of people who sometimes don't want to talk about history, don't want to learn history, don't want to pass on history, want to blame people for history, want to do all kinds of stuff for history. And, and, and to me, it's kind of like a house, you know? And we got this house. And at one time, we only had so many folks in the house. You know, everybody here wasn't in the house. Just, just so many folks were in the house. And, and over time, you know, we got more and more people coming in the house. We, we, we've added some folks. And, and we didn't quite maintain the house as, as well as we should have maintained it. So, so now, when we inherit the house, the house is not as in great shape. You know, the walls are a little dingy, and the floors are a little funky, and need some paint and holes in the roof and all that. But if we're going to inherit it, and if we're going to accept that inheritance, then to me, we don't spend too much time talking about well, who caused the hole in the roof, or who caused the floor to sag, or, or any of that stuff. We talk about, hey, we're all going to inherit this house, so let's fix this shit up and go. You know? So to me, it's the same kind of way with the country. I, I could care less about spending too much time about, well, who put the hole in the wall? And we didn't have a big enough house when it was just you, you in the house. And, and now that we've added black women to the house and black men to the house, we need a big, I, I could care about all the folks on the side of the house. If you're going to inherit the house, take on the responsibility that comes with maintaining that house. And, and that's why I like to tell these kind of stories about unsung heroes. Because I think it expands the way that we all think and the way that we think about each other and the way that we see ourselves and the way that we see our country. And to me, that's what Juneteenth is about. I had a friend who said some crazy thing to me. One of my friends was saying, oh, well, you know, it's Juneteenth. So does that, is that like on St. Patrick's Day? All of us going to be Irish now? Everybody's Irish? So everybody's going to be what for Juneteenth? And my answer was, everybody's going to be 